They have some technical issues, minor ones. Okay, let me see which screen you can share. Okay, so uh, do you see my screen shared? It should be blank page like that. Okay. Yes. So we'll we'll, we'll start from uh, okay. Uh, before we start, right? Sort of uh, again. My name is Artek Malkonyan. I am. I have two functions in uh, UNDP. Two two major sort of heads. Um, in I am based in Bangkok in Asia Pacific, and about 30, 40 percent of my time is devoted to. Uh, working in Asia Pacific region uh, on the concept of so-called SDG finance or sustainable finance applied to the private sector across all asset classes, so from startups till capital markets and everything which is in uh, in between that. Uh, and uh, I'm looking after those um, different asset classes globally, which is about seventy percent of my time. I look after uh, the same concept of again SDG finance applied to private sector, but specifically for private equity, VCs, and the accelerators. I'm also global lead behind impact venture accelerators of UNDP. It's a network of accelerators that we, we, we run. Now, um, again, since uh, uh, the, the, you have the sort of uh, advanced program, so what I would uh, like to start with is the overall uh, notion of uh, what is impact and, and why it is important and why we look how we are looking at that in a sort of and uh, yeah. you know the significance of that again I think again most probably many of those topics are covered through other presentations and lectures but I'll try to make it more applicable to the um, to VC accelerator startups etc right. So again, I think, uh, uh, and I'm not sure if uh, these topics are covered in this way. This is quite, a, uh, say, unusual uh, way of presenting what uh, uh, we usually take as an impact investing. Now, again, you, uh, many of you have um, seen this uh, guy. You know him, right? This is the guy who came up with this uh, very interesting uh, book called The Wealth of Nations probably referred as father of the, of the market economics, um, Adam Smith. And um, uh, in his book, uh, uh, basically he uh, called The Wealth of Nations, he, uh, he, he talked about um, uh, something called um, self-interest, right? So, and, and the, the premise was that if everybody acts from based on his self-interest, when we have something called invisible hand of the markets, which basically regulates all the market relationships. And okay, so and that actually shaped the next 20, 200, 250 years of um, our economic lives. Um, now, um, well, did it work that concept that we should work based on our own if self interest and if that is done when everything will be right? Well, it actually did work. So we, we have seen wealth uh, of nations growing up and people living better uh, based uh, on, on some of those uh, fundamental principles. Now, um, so we do have economic and social progress. So again, I think there was something like, um, you know, uh, there are some issues which uh, purely from the humane perspective, uh, so sort of is not that comfortable to us saying, okay, we, we are not really that sort of creatures to think only about our self-interest. And um, and there had been also certain gaps in the system and some problems which were indicated uh, in throughout that, that journey. And this is uh, 
the, the time when we, we said that, okay, see, uh, there are issues coming, there are some sort of negative externalities, inequality, uh, climate issues, social um, issues here and there, and, and maybe capitalism is not working or it's not working properly, so there needs to be some adjustments made to that. Now, now guess what? Um, uh, the same guy, actually, uh, again, he's called the economist, but that time there was no such specialty as the economist, right? Uh, the same Adam Smith um, back then, he was, he was actually a moral philosopher. You know, and even before the Wealth of Nation, he came up with another book called uh, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And, and there he was b basically contemplating that, you know, we, we feel good not only in those cases where, where we are sort of taking something, we are receiving something, but for us to feel uh, satisfied, we need to give. So it's a matter of, taking and giving so both aspects are important so it's uh, instead of self-interest there is also the concept of others or other regard right or in another word uh, altruism okay altruism was nothing new it's not the invention of uh, adam smith it is it was there in back in greek philosophy people are saying that it, it comes you know it's a around an argument whether it is part of our upbringing or it is part of our you know uh, human nature, but usually, yes, we do have those feelings. Everybody wants to share. You know, if you are, you, you, you look at the interests of the others, uh, probably your family. If you are a bit better person, maybe family and neighbors. If you are even better person, neighbors and community. If you are even better person, you know the uh, the, the whole city, country, uh, the planet, right? Sort of. So uh, the concept of altruism was, always was there. So the concept that we, we need to, not only to take care of our self-interest, but also interest of the others um, has been there and it has been pointed uh, even uh, in those times. It's just um, for some reason we ignored uh, and, and didn't um, uh, factor uh, those aspects in, in our, uh, the way the economy was built, right? Uh, but uh, with time, uh, we start understanding that, uh, listen, um, uh, you know, this aspect needs to be addressed. Uh, so there have been different terms used uh, on trying to bring the concept of, again, the, let's call it, care for other things, but your own profit or your own business. Uh, and there have been different terms used, different concepts, those are still there. And unfortunately, those um, terms are used interchangeably these days. People are talking about uh, social responsible investing, ESG, impact investments, um, corporate social responsibility, sustainable investments. So there's a bunch of terms used in interchangeably, creating a lot of confusion. Now, to, to clarify that, we basically, first of all, need to understand, uh, okay, so how, how that works, how we integrate this concept of sustainability because in all those terms the concept of sustainability or social element is you know pointed to but again to navigate first we need to clarify what is sustainability in the context of business right now um this is um the sort of a an interesting uh, venn diagram uh, to clarify sort of what is that concept of sustainability as this overlapping area between social, economic, and environmental interests or people, profit, and uh, planet. Now, again, uh, this is, um, uh, this concept is sort of rooted in another one, which you might have heard of uh, back in 90s, the concept of triple bottom line was introduced. And, uh, and, and that was sort of saying that, listen, the companies sh should not only focus on their financial performance, but also on their impact on people and planet, right? As, as, a, as part of the results, that even mm, that approach uh, was um, sort of claiming that uh, the companies which are operating in this area, the sweet spot of sustainability, they get a competitive edge over their um, peers. Uh, and, and in fact, even back in 90s, uh, beginning of you know, 2000, there have been data which was shown, which which have shown um, a very strong correlation between sustainability and 
revenue and, and actually profit making. So, and, but people did not believe into that. They were saying, oh, listen, you know, uh, it's not that uh, companies uh, targeting sustainability make more profit, vice versa. They have more profits, we have more money so that they can afford targeting sustainability, right? So causality was questioned, though, though correlation was evident. Now, fortunately, by now, uh, 30 years uh, later, almost, 30 years, uh, we have uh, thousands of studies which are saying, no, it's actually you, you sustainability uh, efforts related and directed towards sustainability result in improving financial performance and even improving the risk resilience, especially during crisis times. Whereas this research from meta research from New York University recently, uh, not that recently, 2021 published, it's based on 900 plus studies, which have came to that, uh, which come to, to that conclusion that, uh, you know, the, the, the data shows uh, both the causality and uh, and, the, uh, and the correlation, right? Now, um, so another way of talking about sustainability is again, this sweet spot between business interest and stakeholders interest. So one of the strategies that we are talking about is moving from shareholders interest concept to a stakeholder interest. Stakeholder being all, all right, so of employees, communities, neighborhood, government, uh, customers, uh, you know, your supply chain partners, sales network partners, etc. So basically everybody. And, and <clears throat> there's this concept again, uh, back uh, 10, 15 years ago, which says that sustainability sweet spot is actually uh, brings to finding new niche uh, markets, market niches, new, new, the processes are made sort of uh, more optimal, um, new, new products and new services are uh, sort of designed and um, and produced because of uh, you know engaging into under under this concept or operating under the uh, sustainability principle now again coming back to <clears throat> this concept of uh, impact investing uh, we'll, we'll be discussing that and we'll be discussing also how different is that from uh, the other elements but uh, interestingly enough um, impact investment is probably the most fashionable terms these days. Um, and it was sort of associated also with social entrepreneurship. And people were referring to that even as to the invisible heart of the markets, as opposed to invisible hand of the markets. Uh, so there was this term used by, uh, nailed by some of the scholars and, and um, you know, there was this consensus that those two things need to work together, the, the hand of the market and the heart of the market should work together. I mean, impact investment or social entrepreneurship, again, if you if you go a bit deeper into the conceptual terms, uh, these are basically the same things. It depends on which side you are looking at. If you are looking from the investment perspective for finance side, it's called impact investing, right? If you are looking from enterprise side, it could be called a social entrepreneurship. But now, um, the conceptually, people were even talking about creating, uh, coming up with a new fourth sector in the economy. In addition to private sector, public sector, and social sector, is a fourth sector. Now, again, the private sector does what? It, it makes money. Government comes and takes part of that money to address some of the externalities that business is usually not addressing, such as defense, you know, healthcare, education, and some of the other things, right? When a uh, social sector also takes part of the money in the form of charity or in the form of financing from the government and usually addresses some of those issues. Um, but both the government and the, the social sector, non for profit sector, where uh, they are based, it's, it's a budget based structure, so we are burning money to do something good. Uh, now, so we are now talking about the fourth sector, which is working as business, but at the same time targets generating uh, some of those social or environmental benefits, right? Or addressing those externalities. So uh, so the, the difference here is that we are not saying give us budget for us to burn to do something good. We are saying invest in us. And we'll do something good and address some of the problems which previously were addressed uh, by the uh, full sort of, I, I would say, uh, budget spending mechanisms, right? Now, again, uh, and people are referring to so-called fourth sector uh, and even uh, some of the companies which are working under that um, 
context, um, you know, the governments came up you know, with special legal forms, like in the US, where it's something called for benefit companies, as opposed to for profit and non for profit, where something called for benefit, right? And, and there are similar cases also in the UK, Italy, and Europe as well. So there are some of the, uh, you know, for purpose companies, etc. So the names are different. But basically, all of a sudden, we start having that interesting new area uh, within the economy. And, and you can see those two guys down here. Uh, you know, I think you can recognize the, the other guy next to Adam Smith, right? So, uh, okay. So, uh, and, and what has happened, um, all of a sudden, um, we, we start having those uh, uh, funds um, entirely specialized in impact, right? Or impact investing, and we start popping up here and there. Uh, but what was even more interesting is that many mainstream players, you can see some of those names like JP Morgan, et cetera, start moving into the area of impact investing, not out of um, charity or out of PR, but because we start seeing, um, you know, the commercial sense in, 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 in doing that. And uh, we have seen that in many cases when uh, some of the big asset managers asset owners after experimenting with the concept of impact investing uh, have seen that it might perform even better than uh, commercial investments and start moving and putting their commercial money behind the, the, the concept. So uh, now again, so what is impact investing? Three things we need to, to, to look at, right? Intent, contribution, and measurement. It should be intentional. It should be measurable because uh, the the very promise of impact investing is that it becomes um, one of the corporate targets. But again, before we come to that, let's let's go back to those terms and clarify in our minds what does what means what, right? So, uh, from one side here on the left side, we have traditional investing, uh, and and this is where the concept of um, you know usually referred as CSR, corporate social responsibility, comes in when uh, people try to do. I mean, uh, the, the business is there. It, it tries to operate at the market uh, return level and there is no impact, but CSR is done so that some sort of a paid back uh, to, back to the society or addressing some sort of environmental issues are addressed. Now, uh, so it's like a doing, uh, but, but in most cases, it's, it's more like doing goods for, uh, good deeds for good publicity, right? Sort of, uh, it's done uh, in a scattered way, um, uh, I mean, there's nothing wrong with those uh, CSR activities. Uh, people come and you know, renovate schools, uh, set up, uh, you know, plant the parks, etc., for the community. But the, the problem with uh, classical CSR under this concept is that it doesn't change sorry, the nature of the business. It is done. People are even referring to that as a CSR corporate, uh, you know, CPR corporate PR rather than CSR, right? So um, that is why we do not really go on and, and look at okay, uh, you know, what is that behind CSR? And, and again, sort of out outdated term these days. Um, some corporates still are using that, but it's it's not there anymore that much, right? Now, when the concept of responsible investing came. Uh, or uh, responsible business. Now here, we have set of rules, set of values, set of principles, and the companies are committed to perform according to those rules, principles, and values. And it's like a rule book that we need to comply with while building and operating uh, uh, their, their operational processes. So, so the, the, the matter of compliance. Now, this is much better than CSR because it start sort of changing the business. It makes business to behave properly, uh, but it's not the ideal one. Now, the next concept is basically sustainable investing. And this is where the concept of uh, uh, ESG fits into. And here uh, there is this recognition that um, you know, there are three sets of factors such as environmental, social, and governance. And those factors have very sort of a um, uh, they are very important from the long-term perspective. And if not addressed now properly, they represent risks to the company. So if they represent risks, we need to, some, to do something around that. So ESG, frankly, is nothing more than a risk management tool. Yes, based on structured 
data analysis, well-defined strategies and efforts, but um, it's a risk management tool. It's a tool uh, so that companies are using to address potential issues in those three areas, right? Now, when comes the concept of impact investing? Now, impact investing, the, the difference here is that you are saying, okay, effort is nice, but what we need to do, we need to go one step further and understand what is the result of those efforts. Uh, and that those results or the entirety of those results or entirety of those outcomes is, is called the impact here. And, and interestingly, in impact investing, we have two approaches. Now, uh, one is called finance first, the other one is impact first. Finance first says, listen, we, we, we want to generate impact, we want to target impact, impact because one of our corporate goals, but not necessarily the most important. It's not the ultimate goal, it is one of the goals along with Uh-oh. Uh, uh, um, please tell me where I where, where yeah. do I disappeared, you know, from what point yeah. we just we just lost you when you were talking about impact um and whether okay. you're pricing it or going with that. And we we're on okay, let me definition of term. Yeah. yeah, okay, let me go back to that. Okay. Do you see my slides? They're coming up now. Yep. Okay, perfect. So, uh, yeah, um, so uh, on, on um, impact, right? Sort of, again, on impact investing, we have those two concepts. My, my first one is called finance first. The other one is called impact first. The difference here is the following. But in finance first, we are saying, again, the we want to see impact as a target, as a, a one of the targets of our company, right? Now, not necessarily the most important. It is at the same level as the other targets, such as you know, marketing targets, profit targets, etc. cetera. Uh, but we, we are not ready to compromise on our market return. So we want impact, we want to generate impact, but without compromising market return. Uh, impact first approach says that, listen, uh, important thing for us is impact. We are ready to uh, compromise on the return. So that is why impact, well, and the impact has to be the ultimate goal here. Uh, we are ready to compromise on the return, but still the return has to be above zero, right? So we, we still need to make a profit. Uh, and, and when you can see also the traditional philanthropy and venture philanthropy, venture philanthropy is saying, you know, I want money to come back, but not necessarily we need to make profit out of it, right? Impact first says we need to make profit, but how much profit, you know, it's not important. But finance first says, no, we want to do impact and finance together. Now, if you ask me from the perspective of uh, our work uh, as UNDP, as well as our engagement with a larger mainstream uh, financial sector and private sector businesses, um, much more important is to advocate for finance first. Because finance first approach is usually, uh, I mean, uh, you, you can you can sell it, you can advocate that with all the businesses, right? Impact first approach is for specific, very narrow niche, um, and uh, which uh, scaling of that is quite uh, problematic, doable but problematic. We we still work on the impact first concepts because there are a lot of methods, methodologies, approaches that we learn and uh, pilot there, but. Uh, the main attention is on finance first one because that is the one that you can sort of um, use to scale up um, and convert the mainstream players uh, in the in the finance and the real sector. So uh, uh, again, I think uh, there are many other ways of presenting what is what in in, in this con context of um, uh, you know impact investing and versus uh, ESG, etc. Uh, if you want, we can go deeper into that. Uh, I won't stop in on, on that. Uh, there are different, again, charts that are explaining what approach is applicable to what sort of uh, business case, um, what sort of screening is happen ha happening, you know, sort of what uh, factors are considered, what solution is better working under which concept. I, again, I won't stop 
on that, but I want to bring your attention to the other factor, right? So, so called SDGs, which were introduced back in 2015 and uh, become a game changer, also an impact investment in this in, uh, impact investing sector. Uh, before um, SDGs, we're talking about impact, discrete impact, where had been uh, attempts to measure it, whereas a bunch of indicators proposed and methodology to measure it, etc. But uh, it was, again, an impact was made, proposed as part of the corporate uh, goals. With SDGs, what has happened, um, the global vision was brought in. Uh, and that was not just aspirations, as were specific challenges with specific targets, uh, measurable ones, quantified ones, sorry, um, which are, um, uh, uh, so, 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 so now once you start uh, uh, talking about the impact in the context of SDGs, what um, the, the change that has happened with uh, those who are sort of looking at impact as one of the, their targets. So it's not only just the aspect of measuring how much of this type or that type of impact has happened, but rather understanding what is their, their specific contribution towards achieving that global visionary targets. Because again, this, is, this was the first time when we have a global vision, uh, have all the member UN member countries, uh, states, uh, agreed around the global vision. And for the first time, it was not like a top-down approach. It's, it was more like a wide collaborative approach for very wide spectrum of stakeholders to come in and, and contribute to that, including, uh, uh, I, would, I should not say including, maybe underlying, you know, sort of, um, uh, focusing on the role of the private sector and businesses. Even a special SDG number 17 was introduced, right? It's about the partnerships. But if you sort of go deeper and try to see what that partnerships are about, it's actually bringing private sector into, uh, into these efforts, collaborative efforts to meet the sustainable development goals. You may ask where we are on doing that. We are not progressing well globally. I can tell you that. So we are half on the way in terms of the timing. So 50% 50 time, 50 of time is spent and we have achieved only 15% of the targets. So we are quite behind of the uh, schedule on, uh, on those visionary goals. So that is why it's so important to also again, um, bring that, that notion uh, to the private sector and to the businesses and try to um, align them uh, with this concept, right? Now, um, see, uh, okay, I, I won't stop on that. Uh, th this is an interesting chart. It shows how much money goes uh, from uh, on, on impact investing side. There is also this chart for blended finance, etc. cetera, um, for each of the SDGs, right? And, and the uh, the picture is almost the same, you know, whether we are looking at sustainable finance, blended finance, impact investing, the picture is the same. Now, the most, the biggest controversy here, I don't know if you have noticed it, uh, the SDG, which is probably the most important and the, the precondition for all the other SDGs to happen gets the least amount of money. That's peace justice and strong institutions. Without peace, you can't do everything else, right? Go talk to the Ukrainians or Syrians or the others which have a conflict. So, uh, but unfortunately that brings, uh, that, uh, that uh, SDG number 16 attracts the least amount of money. Again, that's where the controversy is on that side. Now, if we look at the impact investing industry, not from the SDG perspectives, but more from the industry perspective, industrial sector's perspective, again, picture is a bit different for developed and developing countries, which is quite normal. But that gives you also a good understanding of where I would say those sort of impact money flows in the developed world and when impact money flows for the developing worlds. Uh, some areas such as energy, uh, FinTech, um, Financial services are pretty good for 
both, right? But let's say forestry is quite different. Um, you know, sort of healthcare is might be also different, etc. So this is just a picture of uh, where money goes and uh, what uh, asset classes and what are the expected returns for that. Um, again, I want to. Uh, uh, um, so again, if you wish, I can elaborate on this concept of, because many times when I talk to the audience, people are asking, what's the difference between ESG and impact, right? Sort of, we can describe that uh, for you to just a um, uh, couple of things to remember is that again, ESG is a risk management tool impact or impact investing is a tool which looks at the ultimate income impact of your activities now if we go technically and look at the esg metrics uh, i will say only 70 percent of environmental indicators are quite close to what could be called as an impact outcome but seven thirty percent no social indicators have almost nothing to do with uh, outcome uh, uh, the same is with governments right so uh, so that's where the difference uh, on that comes in again uh, the, the purpose of our discussion is not that today but I just had those slides in case you you, know, you, you are very sort of um, interested to know what is the difference between ESG measurement and um, and impact measurement uh, so uh, again, here is a table which shows the, the, the differences between those approaches. Uh, just because again, this is a very popular question when I talk. But again, I want I don't want to now uh, stop on it. Um, this slide is very interesting, and this is where I want to have some sort of your inputs, right? So this is a concept of um, I can call it a, I call it a tagging problem because once the SDGs were introduced. We all have seen all sort of, you know, corporate startups, SMEs, whoever, we come and start, you know, saying, oh, yeah, I'm doing SDG number this, you know, number that, you know, we're doing this sort of tick box thing. So, yes, we are working for this and that SDGs. And that starts creating a problem. And that's quite sort of um, irritating these days to, to see, especially from those professionals who are working in, 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 in those areas. Um, here... We have the case of investment decisions based on, um, I would say, impact criteria, right? Sort of some impact criteria. You can see uh, five technologies. Uh, these are uh, technologies for packaging the liquids, um, like liquids meaning for consumer markets, beverages, milk, water, whatever, right? And uh, we are looking at some of the impact indicators here, uh, such as... Um, the usage of natural resources, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, usage of water, as well as the uh, weight of the ultimate container under that technology. Now, my question to you, so if you were impact concerned and making investment based on this impact concept of impact investment, so which technology would you choose? Any idea? <clears throat> It should be pretty obvious, right? Yeah, Project One's coming up in the chat. I think it has the logo of many of these things, right? Yeah, so absolutely. So Project One seems to be the, the best one because it is, it is, but let me say, it's the least detrimental uh, during production, detrimental to the nature, right? Project Four seems to be the worst one out of those. Uh, but now let's see what is it. Unveiling. So we just have chosen PET bottles, which was chosen back, uh, which was scaled up back in 80s, right? And a couple of decades forward, become probably the second or third largest pollutant in the oceans on the lens. And we are now going back to those other one, Project 4, right? Glass bottles. So um, now, again, this is not an isolated incident. We have seen such type of things happening in, uh, let's say, rural communities going bankrupt. Uh, we have seen um, affordable housing projects, uh, right, uh, becoming uh, 
concrete high-rise slums. We've seen uh, uh, promoting biofuel resulting in deforestation. Uh, we are now seeing uh, all these electric vehicles creating the problem with um, uh, you know, recycling of batteries or sharply increasing the demand for electricity, which not necessarily comes from renewable sources, but from brown sources, right? So why this is happening? This is just that sort of a sobering uh, realization that surface level of impact analysis doesn't work, really. You should not do that. You should not do tick box, or you should not even go and try to assess things based on one or a couple of indicators. We need to go and start looking at those things uh, in a much more profound way, uh, interconnectedness, interrelatedness of uh, those indicators. We need to do extrapolation in terms of, uh, you know, the uh, uh, what will happen if that scales drastically, and what will happen, let's say, uh, 20, 30 years down. Well, up to the future, right? Let's say uh, that way. So this is just an um, indication of uh, importance of what is called impact measurement and management, right? And 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 this is where uh, all sort of uh, methodologies comes in. I mean, you 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 some of you have, might have heard about the IMP uh, impact measurement project, which is now I think we changed the name. So it makes uh, you to think about impact in several dimensions, right? Sort of. They said, uh, you need to define what is impact, you need to define who are the beneficiaries, you need to define how much impact is produced um, and how much uh, has its own sub-dimensions such as scope, uh, depth, uh, and, and duration of impact. Uh, when there is this concept of uh, impact not happening with the risk of the impact and contribution of that, I mean, there's a bunch of other things here, and it's it's a complex model. It's not as a simple financial setup, right? You you increase revenue, decrease cost, you maximize profit. Not at all. It is much more complex, uh, and uh, and uh, and we have seen also, you know, sort of um, sometimes impact backfiring. Uh, we have seen clothing lines or I don't know, apparel shoe lines, which are based on recycled materials, but consumers are not buying it because we believe the quality is inferior, right? It's low quality. So uh, this sort of impactful invest, impact investment is not performing. Um, we have seen um, hotel chains, resort hotel chains, introducing um, sustainability practices and when becoming, well, being marketed as sustainable, end up seeing bookings and reservations going down. Why? Because people think that uh, if the resort is sustainable, most probably the towels will not be snow white or I don't know, not enough pressure in shower or there won't be enough, I don't know, to toiletries, uh, you know, sort of consumable ones, etc. cetera, right? So, so again, impact is very complex and uh, a struck, well, concept that we need to learn how to work with. And the best way is to, to use some of those methodologies and methods which are there. And it is it shouldn't be, again, just ticking the boxes, right? Um, yeah, the, the format of our presentation does not allow me to go into more detail on how to do those things. But uh, one thing uh, that we need to recognize is that um, uh, this concept of impact measurement and management, it's like uh, shifting from your, it's like, again, giving you a magnifying glass through which you start looking at the business. It's like shifting a car dashboard to this pilot uh, uh, instrument panel, right? With all sorts of indicators, alarming lights here and there. Yeah, so, so what that results in is that you start understanding all the, you zoom in into all the nitty gritty aspects of your business. You know, you, you, you optimize the internal processes, you understand what are the needs of the employees, um, you, you get uh, yes, uh, better consumer engagement, customer engagement, new niches, improved partnerships, etc. So, and ultimately also better managing the risks. Like, like, again, you have two projects. One, you look just like that. The other one, you look for the magnifying glass. Apparently, which one will be performing better? In a nutshell, you have bigger picture or a detailed picture, uh, you make smarter moves. 
and that results in your business performance. And this is actually the main selling point behind uh, impact measurement and management and also impact investing. Uh, so that that could appeal to wider circles in the in the private sector. So um, again, in, in terms of strategies, how to uh, integrate impact into your uh, into your businesses, as I mentioned, one concept is to move from this sort of perspective of shareholder value to stakeholder value. The other one is uh, move from compliance to value alignment to making impact as an objective. Another way of presenting it is to avoid doing harm for the business activity to understand what is your impact and who are the benefiting stakeholders. But uh, from the perspective of startups, if we talk about that, so that we will look, uh, for example, we, UNDP, we work with those startups which are coming up with a systemic solutions to uh, to impact to, to the SDGs, right? So it's not just creating a benefit to uh, some ben beneficiaries. It is to propose a business-based solutions which are scalable, transformative, and disruptive from the impact perspective. And and if if you like this uh, play or juggling with the uh, abbreviations, we can say that we are moving from CSR to ESG. And went to uh, SDGs, right? Sort of that's that could be another way of you know, presenting um, how uh, businesses can can move uh, in that. Now again, there is all those stages, as I said, right? CSR, uh, responsible investing, sustainable investing, ESG or impact investing. So all these stages we do not contradict to each other. Those are just one is built upon the other. So and we we are welcoming any activity, but we are even more sort of welcoming, admiring, and, 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 and you know, sort of uh, cheering those who are moving from one concept to the other one, uh, progressing, making impact, or integrating the sustainability more into the business strategy. So I'll, I'll stop here. Um, now, uh, how many of um, you guys are startuppers. I have a couple of slides for you as well, if you if you wish. Um, so, uh, or I can just stop and go to the chat box and um, and talk about that without slides, right? Let me open the chat box to see. Wow. Okay. So I'll stop here. Uh, rather than showing you more slides, powerful ones, I would rather go and ask uh, respond to your questions. Yeah, what questions are coming up? Yeah. Can, uh, there was a lively discussion in the chat, but maybe we'll voice the questions instead. Yeah. Oh, okay. Now, uh, let me add a couple of things for... Uh, we for have two here. Uh, we have one for Amr. We have Jock yeah. as well. Who'd like to go first? Uh, I'm happy to go first. Um... I guess in general, you had mentioned, thank you so much for the time. This is really interesting. Um, you mentioned at the beginning, um, you had worked with things like accelerators and um, blended yeah. finance models in general. And I was intrigued to see like, how does that play into your work? Cause that's something that's like kind of top of mind for me and my work. I, I work with a startup actually as well. It's building a fund um, mm -hmm. and thinking about how to build out talent accelerators and entrepreneurship incubators and not really the difference between those two. And then, how you all look at integrated blended finance models. And I know you mentioned impact first versus finance first and all those ideas are swimming my head, um, particularly with new structures and new new areas, mm -hmm. new nation like economies that haven't been hit yet. Sorry, that was all over the yeah. place. But, um, yeah. Yeah. I'd love to hear some thoughts on that. Okay, so um, uh, we, we start working on this concept. We, we introduced actually the concept of impact venture accelerators back in 2016. The whole idea was to bring together the uh, business acceleration with robust uh, impact element, right? And uh, impact element means uh, curriculum related to impact as well as impact measurement and management aspects and impact screening criteria. The whole idea was to have the accelerator to to work on scaling not only technology and business models, but also impact models. And, and again, initially we start working with uh, so-called social enterprises, but when we drifted from that concept and start working with businesses. 
because most of the social enterprises were coming from uh, previous, I would say, non-for-profits, and we were trying to implant a business mechanism to that, and it was really not scalable. The, uh, the opposite approach, working with businesses while trying to elevate their impact um, parts, right, sort of elements, and uh, was much more successful. So why we start doing that, it was again with this context of going to the mainstream guys and telling them, listen, you can do a finance first option, right? You don't need to compromise your revenues. You just need to pay attention to impact. And we were saying, yes, why, why not? Uh, but show us the pipeline, where's the pipeline? Where I can put my money into, where, into something which makes money and makes impact, right? So this is where we, we said, okay, let's do the impact venture accelerators as our first step towards uh, doing that. Now, again, we, we tried the concept of incubation. Uh, in the concept of impact uh, accelerators, we do have boot camps, pre-accelerators, all sort of other things. Um, we, we are supporting some of the mainstream VCs uh, in their uh, venture studios or venture building activities as well, right? Sort of that's, that is in there and, um, uh, again, we, we do operate a network of accelerators and we have a couple of really impressive uh, uh, results from there. We do not invest in the UN. We are not supposed to make any profits uh, from anything, but and we usually, most of our accelerators, 95% of those, they are operated in a partnership with an established ones, like with 500, uh, Global, Draper, uh, venture network, uh, seed stars, and you, you name it, right? Sort of um, depends on the region, etc. And they are multi theme, theme specific, country specific, regional, cross regional, global. So all, all, all forms and formats are, are doable. Now, to your question about the blended finance. Now, see, um, people are quite confused about the term blended finance as well, as they are confused about those. Um, sustainability and business aspects, right? Those terms that are used, CSR, etc. Now, um, if I compare it with impact invest, impact investing is a strategic finance approach, right? It's a strategy, financial. We are saying, I want to make money and I want to make profit, right? Uh, blended finance is not a strategic approach. It is just structuring approach. Now, what is happening? Uh, any private sector, any business decision is made based on three factors, right? Uh, revenue or profit, risk associated with that, and liquidity, especially if you are an investor. So liquidity aspect. So only, uh, by the way, not only financial decisions, marketing decisions, HR decisions, whatever, these are the three major elements that you, you, you are considering while making business decision. Uh, so if we have a project which might create some impact or a project that might have a developmental uh, sort of impact, right? And, and we want private sector to come in, into that. Private sector comes and tells, oh, listen, um, this project ever doesn't make enough profits or it is too risky or it is not liquid. Okay. In such a case, we are saying, okay, wait. So we will try to address your concerns. If you think it is too risky, we will provide a de-risking instrument. And by the way, there might be a financial de-risking instrument like first loss capital and guarantees. There might be non-financial de-risking that we are also capable of helping to arrange such as the price contracts or fixing the tariffs for renewable energy, something like that, right? So it's a non-financial one. Second, uh, it says, oh, yeah, there's not enough money. You know, profitability is not. I say, okay, listen, uh, we can propose you um, a return enhancement tool, right? And usually uh, we attach those re, uh, return enhancement tools uh, with an impact. We're saying, listen, if no problem, you, you invest, you make money, but also make uh, impact. If we see that impact, achieved will pay you premium on top of that right so uh so that's a return enhancement mechanism for example with vcs return enhancement works better 
with private equity, uh, de-risking works better because private equity looks after the, so they are, they are concerned about downside protection, right? While VCs are more concerned about upside boosting, right? downside, where we don't care, right? We know that out of 40 investments, 75 will die anyway. So, so it depends on, on which asset class you are working. Uh, uh, liquidity aspect, we're addressing for diversification also this concept of aggregation, right? So into the portfolios of disaggregation or aggregation. So yeah, those are financial methodologies. But the, the, the issue here is that uh, the difference between those blending, uh, and this is all blending methodologies. So you have three blending things, right? So the risking, enhancement, and I would say uh, maybe reducing the entry entry barrier, such as technical assistance, subsidizing feasibility studies, all sort of other things there, right? So, uh, but the difference between those methods and impact investing is that impact investing is not directly addressing those things. It actually brings the fourth element. It brings the impact. So it says now, private sector, you need to look at uh, profit, revenue, uh, risk, liquidity and impact and here is a tool set for you to understand what it, you know what is that thing, right so that's how to distinguish between those two two concepts and how we look at you know uh, addressing some of those blending uh, uh, aspects i hope i respond thank you so much that's really helpful Jack, would you Other like questions? questions? Yeah, I, I know we're I know we're pretty much at time, so I uh, didn't want to hold everyone. So all good. Thank you. Oh, I think we have a little bit more time, don't we, Asar? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, I own a business. It's more so focused on on wealth equity um, and and seeing the growth opportunities there. Um, and thinking about equity investing as a form of accelerating growth in this you know, kind of depressed market, right, with with upside opportunity. So to me, it seems like the finance first and impact kind of mesh. Um, but trying to figure out how funds are flowing into that strategy, I was happy to see that the number one SDG was uh, around decent work and economic growth. Um, and, you know, just wondering how that shows up in this wealth equity conversation when it comes to, you know, employee ownership and, you know, equity ownership of these privately owned businesses that, that can significantly grow. So figuring out where the financing happens and um, because we're thinking not about it from an economic perspective, right, we need capital plus labor. And it seems like a lot of those, you know, community-focused equity-type funds, they're very small. They don't have enough capital to really finance that type of growth. Um, so, you know, it, partly because of risk factors, partly because of return factors. Um, but if, yeah, that does happen, where does the big financing come from? Um, uh. Uh, let, let me react to that, see, uh, with a story. Um, uh, there is, uh, in this region, in Asia Pacific, um, you know, there's this country of Singapore, which is very successful, and it's, you know, known quite well in terms of their productivity, efficiency. They said, we, we do have a sovereign fund called Tamasek. It is one of the major investors worldwide as well. So it's like big asset owner. Now, um, these guys... Um, uh, we do work with them. I, actually, I have someone, uh, an officer reporting to me, also sitting in Tamasek's office, right? We, we, we work with them on a couple of issues. But uh, the story is the following. Like five years ago, um, out of their philanthropic pocket, we have a philanthropic arm as well called Tamasek Trust. So out of philanthropic pocket, we put quite a significant amount of money and um, into a, uh, their own impact investment fund called ABC Ventures, right? Uh, $350 million, sizable investment. Now, uh, three years passed, only two years ago, 
we put another half a billion dollar into another investment fund called uh, Leapfrog Investments, uh, originally from Australia, but now global one. Uh, but that half a billion came from commercial pocket, not philanthropy. Now, what that signals, it signals that these guys, when the concept was new, we decided to sort of, let's call it a play with philanthropic money, putting philanthropic money into something. And return was, okay, let's see, right? But once we saw how the impact investment performs, and apparently it performs better than commercial, we start putting commercial money into that, right? Because of this concept of that, but listen, it's, yeah, impact investment does perform better. And again, today, that is what is understanding, that definitely impact investing is performing better than commercial investing. The second question is, what are the costs associated with impact investing? Cost meaning cost of impact measurement. Because for small investment, it might be quite prohibitive. But for big investments, it's not, right? So, and, and where is this sort of a universal consensus today that um, I was a couple of weeks ago at a conference of investors. I mean, we said, I mean, no doubt. So we know about it already, right? It's just how to do that and, uh, you know, how to optimize it. So uh, f from that perspective, uh, at least in some of the countries, that's not any more question. Uh, that is why this sort of a finance first option is uh, really uh, taken by, by those players. Now, uh, though there is a con issue here as well. I mean, people are trying to, you know, do what we call greenwashing, blue washing, you know, sort of, uh, uh, we can call, um, So there are a lot of those things, especially ESG is now criticized a lot, etc. But what we try to do, we try to say, okay, guys, if you have a robust system for impact measurement and management, but it's done at the proper level, so we can minimize all those other, uh, I would say, uh, problems that are connected with those investments. Did I address <laughs> your, 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 your concern on, on that? So my, my point is, uh, it's absolutely doable, uh, and, and there are tools available, by the way, uh, online, uh, there are courses for free, uh, we have even a platform that you can use to do some sort of a self-assessment of that. Uh, let me do this way. So we, we did that conversation, we invited all these asset managers, etc. and you said, okay guys, now tell us why you do, and all of them are investing in impact, right? So we said, no, make it very sort of direct and blunt. Tell us why you are investing in, uh, in uh, why you are doing impact investing. So we have five typologies of them. One said, we do that because that is the requirement of our LPs, investors. LPs are saying that you have to do it. And the LPs are like a pension funds, et cetera, which are concerned about you know, how money are used, right? Second one said, uh, we are doing it because we believe there are type of impacts which are immediately convertible to capital gains. So we want to make extra money. So these are the guys like a VCs, PEs, which are investing in uh, the projects uh, that might result in carbon footprint reduction, but hence carbon credits. Basically they are investing in projects which are making money, but have also additional money making opportunity through carbon credits, right? So, okay. Uh, where are the type of investors which are saying we do that because we believe that doing impact investing is actually increasing our profitability uh, and risk resilience in the long run. Now, these are the most interesting ones. These are the most, uh, you know, uh, important players to us, right? So that's the music to our ears. And there is also the fifth typology, I mean, only the fifth one, which says, I do that because of, I'll say that, sentiments, right? Feelings. I want to be good. I want to save the world. I want to, you know, address social issues. I, I have a, 
working a, with a VC guy who who was like a hardcore VC capitalist, right? He went uh, to snorkel in around one of the islands in Pacific, and when he got stuck because a plastic something blocked his air, and he almost get drowned. So he survived and uh, get converted, saying, "Now all my investments are to go into you know cleaning oceans from plastics, etc." So, but but the reason motive is sentimental, right? It's it's a feelings. It's not financial that he moved into that area. So that's why I'm saying we're like those five typologies. Uh, each has its own reasoning why they are doing it. Uh, but there are the ones which do believe that it has a long-term profitability and long-term risk uh, is much better under impact rather than uh, under the commercial ones. Thank you. Really fascinating Patience? stuff. Are there any more questions from the group? I do have a question, but I, I, I don't want to, I don't know if he has any time. Um, That's okay. No problem. Um, yeah. So I was going to ask, um, um, so I, I still need to do a little bit more, more of a refresh and kind of looking at different asset classes, but I'm curious just from your standpoint, where like which asset class do you see having the most impact kind of looking at just maybe like impact funds or VC private equity? Cause I'm seeing so many different variations right now. And I'm curious, where do you see the most impact? And then which one do you think looking five, 10 years down, do you see kind of um, really um, having a stronghold on, on the space? You know, it's it's an interesting question. Uh, it really depends on um, on your institutional context, right? Um, see, why VCs are interesting for us? Because VCs are, we do have a talent to find uh, disruptive business-based solutions. Solutions which could be scaled up sharply, changing the markets, disrupting the markets, right? So if we are next to them so that those solutions, those new ventures, new products, new services, have this impact element included into that, when that disruption happens, also with an impact element attached to that, right? So that is why VCs are so interesting to us. Not, not because we have money, actually we don't have that much money, Okay, but uh, their function of finding those disruptive solutions are very important to us, right? So that is why we are we, we like also working with them. Uh, on the other hand, um, for example, I work with the capital market regulators and we, um, we introduce something called SDG sustainability guidelines for listed companies, right? So, now, if I can impose through carrot and stick mechanism, big listed companies to comply with some of those aspects or not even comply, but actually measure their contribution towards SDGs, right? That's a big game changer for uh, a particular economy. So this is another uh, end of the spectrum, listed companies, right? Now you might say, okay, so we have VCs, very narrow niche, but when we have these big listed companies there, but what about, let's say, SMEs, right? In many countries, SMEs represent like, I don't know, 60 to 80% of the economy. Now, what I try to do now is um, to make those listed companies to impose their requirements down to their supply chain, okay? For example, like banning usage of plastic by their supply chain. So, because it's super difficult to regulate SMEs. SMEs are almost not non-regulated, non right? Uh, maybe some license, etc. But it's very difficult to to uh, create that mass effect. The other issue is to work with the banks and uh, microfinance, etc., to to cover that that area. So. Uh, 
To respond to your question, it really depends where your institutional priorities are, because uh, yes, money-wise, we should go and talk only with BlackRock and, and the others like that, right? Sort of big sovereign funds, uh, which we are doing, uh, but uh, uh, we should go to the grassroots level as well, uh, because many interesting things, such as those disruptive solutions, etc., happening from there. So, so it it really depends on um, uh, you know which side, uh, which side, from which side you are trying to approach to to resolve the problem. I have a follow up on that actually. If you have a second, sure. are, are we out of time? Yeah, I'm. I'm really intrigued by the whole. I mean, obviously with SMEs, they're really hard to regulate, but I think a lot of extreme poverty situations often the people employed in those spaces are kind of centered in that space. So how do you, if it's hard to regulate, how do you get subsidization to get like investment capital to those entities or like to build like those microfinance ecosystems? Cause that's what I'm kind of interested in right now. See, um, the, 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 the point is uh, it's not an easy problem to work with SMEs, right? So, uh, so there are two parts. One is, I would say SME support through training and capacity building, advocacy, et cetera, right? And then uh, providing financial access or access to financial resources. Now, microfinance in its pure format, uh, or even not microfinance, I would say financial inclusivity in its pure format uh, has a limited potential to address it. And we have seen that. So that is why we are now saying not financial inclusivity, but rather financial prosperity, added to that the social elements, the environmental elements, et cetera. So that, in a, I mean, shortcut that becomes sustainable finance. So we talk about uh, financial, sustainable finance rather than inclusive finance, even for SMEs, right? Now, one of the solutions to that, which has a lot of potential, is fintech. Uh, because fintech allows us to easily do this aggregation and disaggregation of financial tools. They drive the cost of any financial instrument very low, right? So as low as that, I mean, we, we in places like Philippines, etc., we do have fintech which works even in in this area of sachet economies. I don't know, do, do you know the, the term sachet economies? You know, the small sachets of shampoos and all sorts of things. So, so that people are so poor that uh, their transaction happens on, on, you know, if they go to the shop to buy a shampoo, buy the, the bottle, they buy a sachet, right? So for, I mean, we usually see that uh, in McDonald's, etc. the sachets of, uh, uh, ketchup, etc. So, so uh, what I try to say is that um, fintech allows even to target that sachet economy, the economy where transactions are at very, very small level, like again, uh, 20 cents, 50 cents, etc. So, um, and uh, that is probably one of the solutions that are there and which are growing and growing, uh, targeting what we call uh, vulnerable groups, BOP, bottom of pyramid, right? Sort of uh, micro and small enterprises, etc. competing with traditional banks and, uh, and also microfinance because of their uh, sort of uh, uh, optimal uh, optimization or reduction of the uh, cost per transaction aspect. So that's probably one of the solutions, plus also other texts which are attached to that, you know, in terms of the blockchain, et cetera. So all those sort of things are also contributing to that. Um, so yeah, th that probably would be the, the best point. Uh, and also one thing that we also make sure is we sort of um, uh, have, we, we separate the typical SMEs from uh, startups, or let's say from the ventures, which are going into incubation, acceleration, etc. And there was always this debate of how to separate them from each other. Uh, 
and when we came up with the conclusion that uh, the best indicator of that is probably the ambition level of the owners of that venture. Right, if the ambition level goes beyond the 30% annual growth, then probably we can consider it as a venture for um, uh, to which we can look through that lens of uh, accelerators, right? While if it is below that, then we can put it into a typical SME support project, not necessarily requiring such an intensive um, um, programs as accelerators on venture builders, et cetera. So that's uh, another aspect of that. There is a sort of a separation, a clusterization, if you wish, of those players. That was fascinating. Thank you so much. Wait, you said under 30%, over 30% for what? Sorry, I just want to clarify that last point on like what would be- See, if, you, if you have a, if you have a, like again, if you have a venture, right? Um, uh, we the, the question is whether we should take that venture into a typical SME support project, right? SME support policies, etc., or you should take you should take it to a, a, a something like an accelerator. Sure. Yeah. So now, because uh, the accelerators and incubators and all these sort of programs, they are very sort of intensive, they are very focused, very aggressive in terms of the sort of uh, market capacity, business model building, etc. You cannot have all SMEs to go through that. You, you, you need to have the best of the best, right? So best performing, et cetera. Now the question is, what is that parameter of calling best of the best? The parameter, it seems that the ambition level vis-a-vis -vis the growth. If a company wants to grow 10%, 15, 20, that's okay. But that's a typical SME, right? But if the, the a venture wants to grow, a company wants to grow more than 30% annually, when we have attend something which we can take to this concept of accelerations, et cetera, and we can bring guys like VCs to, to look at that for investing. So that's sort of uh, another interesting distinction between uh, those two. Um, uh, and that distinction also results in which financial asset class we are bringing in and, uh, and matching with that particular venture. Understood. Thank you so much. I probably could have to set up another conversation. <laughs> Boy, this is great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asark, for the conversation with us. I'm going to have to drop off to get to my next meeting. Um, if somebody else had another question for you, I can make them the host and you can stay on, but you might also- No, need I, I, I also need to go, you know. Yes, uh, yes. Let, let me go. Great. <laughs> Thank you so much. We'll have another conversation. Thank you so much for your Thank time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Have a good one.